And first things first, Una. Bucharesti, vamos to mes kavati primi. Was it good enough? Yeah. Okay. Uh, merci. Oh, thank you very much for those that don't understand Romanian. Okay. So my name is Ed Smianaga. I'm a director of developer experience at Red Hat. Uh, on Twitter, I'm Ed Yanaga. And today we are going to discuss a bit of some microservice data patterns, especially CQRS and event sourcing. And I chose this topic specially, uh, specifically because I believe there is some confusion in the architecture community on when do you apply or what is this or what is that. So I think uh, it would be useful to make some concepts clearer for, for us developers. I'm also a Java champion and a Microsoft MVP and I work for Red Hat. How cool is that, right? <laughs> and I also happen to be a Brazilian Japanese, which I bet I'm the only one here in the audience. So it makes me a unique combination. So you won't see many Brazilian Japanese around here. I didn't notice any other ones. And uh, this, this talk, uh, the first step of this discussion about distributed data on the microservice world, uh, I gave on this book. So just in case you want to have an electronic version of the book, you can go to this URL and download the free copy. Or if you don't want to type all of that, you can go to my Twitter profile. The pinned tweet has a link to the ebook. So this is the starting point of this discussion, but I believe that it was, wasn't enough. So consider this talk like a, a second step around the discussion about distributed data. And I quote this from my book, quote this easy, state is hard. Because most of the people when they're discussing distributed systems, they only talk about behavior. So it's kind of easy for you to replicate behavior or split behavior be between multiple nodes. But with data, it's always much harder. So before we dig into CQRS event sourcing, we need to introduce some context. So let's roll back 10 years ago and think about how was data managed 10 years ago. If you were a Java, Java developer, you have to think what, which were the technologies that we were using 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, we were still terrified about entity beings. I don't know how many of you are still using AJB 1.0 or 1.1. .1. I hope not many. Oh, sorry for you. And, <laughs> but you know, uh, 10 years ago, it was much more common. So we had like a bit more than 10 years ago, we had Hibernate to help us on this entity beings world. Hibernate 3.0 was released in 2005. You know, it's a long time. Java 6 released in 2006, and JPA 1.0 was released with Java E5 on 2006 too. So it's more than 12 years that we had these different technologies to be able to model our data models in our systems. So basically, 10, 11, 12 years ago, we were able to start replacing that lots of XML configurations into more annotations. We had XML hell, some people say that now we have annotation hell, but you know, just pick your poison, we always have to add this metadata somewhere. So and some, most of the people these days, they prefer to add this metadata into your code. We also started to think about POJOs, and with these POJOs, we created what now we call an emic domain model, because we only had the like, uh, as POJOs, we didn't add behavior on this, this uh, classes, we just, we just used them as containers for data, and this created some kinds of anti-patterns. And at the same time, 10, 12 years ago, the architecture community started to discuss about event sourcing. And event sourcing at that time wasn't a widespread um, concept, so some people started to apply and discuss that in some conferences, in some systems, and I, of course I have to give a brief explanation of what is event sourcing. So let me give you an example. The traditional way for us to think about how can we model and store data in a system is like this. We have an account. I model account like I have an ID, a customer ID, and maybe I have a balance. But you might think that most banking systems, they don't store your money in a row, in a column, saying, well, you have a thousand lay, lay right? Yeah. In your balance, I'm, I'm getting good at that, right? You have a thousand late in your, as the balance of your account, or zero, or minus 500, someone overspent a bit there. 
And this is the traditional way of doing CRUD applications, right? You have this account model in your code, in your memory, and you store this data in an account table with this rows and columns model like that. If you want to use event sourcing, you're not having snapshots of your data anymore because this uh, model represents uh, your, your system state in a certain period of time. So as, the, as time passes, you can see that the, the, the values on the rows and columns, they change. And with event sourcing, we need a different approach. So with event source systems, instead of you know, having snapshots of information, like I look at the system right now, I know this, the state of the system at this point of time, with event sourcing, we think of the system as a stream of events. So we're not modeling account balance anymore as a single row and a column. We're thinking about the, the amount of money that I have in my bank account as a series of transactions. So maybe instead of storing that fixed value, I can assume that all of the bank accounts start with a zero amount of money. And if I model like debt and credit transactions, if everybody starts with zero, if I want to know how much money do I have in my bank account right now, I just have to get from the beginning of time and apply all of the debt and credit transactions. After the calculation, I will have how much money I have in my bank account. So event sourcing is a very nice architecture uh, because you have like f very fast writes. If you need a high throughput on writes on your system, you usually would model as event sourcing. Event sourcing also uh, gives you easy auditing because if you want to know, well, is the amount of money that I'm seeing right now correct? You just have to start from zero and reapply all of the transactions back again. You can check yeah, if the value is correct. You also have a free time machine. I want to know how much money I had one year ago at 3 p.m on the last, uh, last Friday of March, you'll be able to start from zero and apply all of the transactions until that exactly timestamp. So these are some of the advantages of using an event source system. So, but you might be thinking, it's not that easy for us to use this event sourcing model in the system that we model these days. But one of the advantages of using event sourcing well, one, uh, one more advantage of using event source systems is that it enables you to think about the events that happen in our system instead of just thinking about the state, the current state, right? And uh, I, uh, uh, I'm guilty too, and I think that most old people, the system analysts, the architects, they came from like a SQL background. We started, and if you think about like how we used to model uh, systems 10 or 20 years ago, if you think about, if you were talking to the customer, well, let's try to model your application. What your application have is that uh, I have a customer, a customer has an ID, has a name, has an address, has a phone, then I have the, this, this invoice, invoice has these and that. The very first discussions that we had with our customers when we were modeling a system were about which kind of uh, types and information we had in our data structures. And only later we started discussing, well, when I have a customer, this kind of thing happens and I have to change the state to this and that. So I think uh, part of the, of the problem that we have these days when we're talking about distributed systems is that events are much more important, but we're still used to think about the data structure of the problem first before thinking about the behavior. And some people might advocate for that. In a distributed system, it's much more useful to, for you to think first about the events of the system rather than on the structure of the data. So that's one of the discussions that we might have today. Another important thing that I have to tell you is uh, about CQS, Command Query Separation. I have this beautiful uh, phrase coined by Bertrand Meyer, the, the, the inventor of the AFL language, and the design by contract concept too. Asking a question should not change the answer, right? And if you, feel, if you read about the CQS principle, command query separation, it states that you, in your code, you should have methods that query the information, and you should have methods that update the information. You should never have a method that does both, like if you like um, uh, increment and get, which is basically a violation of the, the CQS pattern. So uh, you should have uh, different methods for querying and updating data. And ideally, you also should have separate interface. So if you're coding Java, you should have an interface 
grouping all the right methods, and you should have a read interface grouping all the read methods. Probably when you're coding your Java class, you will implement both interfaces in the same class if you have a very simple model. But if you do separate your inter surface interfaces to read and write uh, methods, it would be much easier for you to later to be able to implement this read and write interfaces using different technologies, which is the case in, uh, that we're interested in right now in distributed data, okay? So it all started with CQS, here, I emphasize the quote again. And now let's start the discussion about CQRS, Command Query Responsibility Segregation. Greg Young was the first person to, to, to coin and to talk about the, this acronym. And it's a very fancy acronym for a very simple work that you. It basically states that you can have different read and write data models, okay? So you can consider that, that CQRS might be an evolution about CQS because if you're doing CQS properly, you very likely uh, 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 are going to have a CQRS architecture. So just to give an example, if you have CQRS architecture, traditional CRUD architectures, you have a customer, you're modeling a customer, you have a customer class, you have a customer table and dependencies. You want to write, you just populate a customer object and you ask GPA or JPA or HarmonyDB to write this object to the database. If you want to query your customer from the database, you just create a query and it retrieves all the customer objects into memory and you can perform your operations in Java. This is the simplest possible architecture and it's the most appropriate one for like 90% of the use cases. But sometimes you might have some issues if you're using CRUD, and if you have this kind of problems, you probably want to have a CQRS architecture. So how do you model? For example, here if I have a customer, I have ID, name, phone, address, and birth. I have many rows and these columns in my system. If I want to insert something in a CRUD architecture, I just generate a SQL statement insert into customer, and I pass the values of each one of these columns. If I want to query this information, I I just do select everything from customer and I get all of this data. But you might think that customer, the customer table evolves over time. So here is a very simplistic model, but you can see that in the real world, customer table can have a lot of data and can have a lot of dependencies. So your select everything from customer might become expensive, right? And you're going to populate a lot of things in memory just to use maybe just a couple of fields. So then somebody comes with a requirement, I need a report. And this report only requires for me like an ID, a name, and a phone of a customer. You see, customer has a lot of information, but I need to create a report with just these three fields. What do you do? For performance reasons, you create a custom query. Query only this information, you just retrieve this information in memory. Very likely, if you're using JPA or Hibernate, you're going to create like a customer DTO, which will just hold the information for you to create your report. And we're done. We solved the problem, and congratulations to us, we created a CQRS model because we're still writing using the customer class, but we're reading using the customer DTO class. And if we, if we implemented that correctly, we also use it separate methods and separate se service interface for that. And this is the simplest possible CQRS architecture that we might have in our system. And, um, another day, somebody comes with another requirement. I need a different report with the three different fields. You just create a select ID, name, address from customer. You create another DTO. You generate your other report. You solve the problem. But that's the simplest possible CQRS architecture that you might have. Then, after that, you realize that you're not constrained to having a single source of information on the database. You might have separate data stores for writing and reading. And this is by far the most popular architecture that we have in the distributed data world. We will have CQRS architectures with separate read and write stores. So we're going to write our information in a certain data store and we're going to read this information from a separate data store. So many people uh, think that, well, I want to create a microservices architecture, and the typical use case that I've been uh, run into many different companies and teams, like I, I decide I want to extract a piece of information from a monolith, I extract this information, like for example, give customer again, I create, 
a customer microservice. I extract the customer information, the customer tables and relationships. Because I'm doing everything right in my monolith, I have a customer DAO, all the data access to my customer information is through a DAO. So what do I do to keep everything running properly? I create a customer microservice with a REST endpoint. I change all of my DAO information to perform HTTP queries through the network to the remote endpoint, and everything work, will work fine. I deploy that to production, it fails miserably because you have a high latency, your everything is slow, well, it doesn't handle, uh, uh, the demand, so you think, well, it's slow, that's a performance problem, right? How do you solve a performance problem? You add cache, now you have more problems. You start with an internal cache, you just add a map in memory to your monolith. Well, now it's faster, but not fast enough. Then you decide that you need uh, an external cache. So you create a key value store, you store the things there, and now it's faster. But then you have another problem because customer DAO wasn't the only entry point to your customer data. So now you have a lot of different reports in your system that use it to join the information from customer in the database. And now you have tables and you have objects in memory and you have to join this information with code. Then later you decide, well, that's not a very good approach. Why don't we create a copy table of the customer data that I need on my monolith database and I still write here on the customer microservice, but I find a solution to replicate the data from here to there. Congratulations. You just realized that you created a write data store and a read data store in a secure S architecture. So the discussion that we're going to have right now is which techniques and technologies uh, we can use to replicate the data from the write data store to the read data store. This is a typical use case for most implementations of distributed data in microservices architecture or simply distributed architectures, right? So, but distributed data is not the only application for secure S. Like maybe you want to generate a report and this report has some complex aggregations or you have to join like multiple tables and you have like frequent access to that. Maybe you want to improve the performance of your system and what do you do? You create a view. So when you want to uh, generate your report in memory, you create a query against this view, right? A view is a secure S read that is store because you're still writing to that table and you're reading your information from another source. So that's uh, uh, another form of secure S read that is store, right? So you can use views, you can use materialized views, and this is mainly the discussion that I had on my book. But we can discuss further steps right now. So we know what is event sourcing, we know what is secure S, and again, secure S event sourcing, why am I discussing this today? Because they couple very well. Usually, it, again, it's not a, a, a true, a, 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 a absolute truth, but usually when you have an event sourcing architecture, you also have a secure S architecture. And uh, when Greg Young coined the term secure S architecture is that, uh, we had a CRUD model in the mind of all of the architects and they wanted to introduce event sourcing, but it was so hard for people to grasp event sourcing properly that they decided, well, maybe we need an intermediate step between having a CRUD model and an event source model. That's why they created SecureS, but SecureS proved to be such a useful solution that we use it for many different use cases these days, right? So first step was to make it as an intermediate step between both event sourcing and CRUD, but now we use for many different things. One of the uh, simplest possible applications for secure S and event sourcing, I will use the bank account example again. Maybe I chose to use event sourcing to model the, the amount of money that I have in my bank account with debit and credit transactions, but you might have guessed that it's very fast for writing, but very slow for reading. So every time I need to query how much money do you have in your bank account, I have to start from zero and start adding and subtracting the values, debt and credits. And the more transactions I have and the more customers I have, the more slow the system gets. So uh, what can we do? Maybe we can create a secure S read data model as an account. And this account has a balance too. But this balance on this table is not the true source of information. It's just a cached value because the true source of information is still the event source. But whenever I write a transaction 
in my transaction table, I can synchronously or asynchronously update the amount of money that I have in my balance in my account table, right? So you might have synchronous transactions, uh, you might have asynchronous uh, transactions being uh, updating the balance in your bank account, but if you want, the true source of information is always the event log, but you query against your balance for performance reasons, right? So typical use case of secure asset architectures, performance. That, that's why sometimes you go to your ATM, you withdraw some money, then immediately after you just get your mobile phone and query how much money do I have in my bank account, and oh, the money is still there. Don't worry, the bank never loses money, but it just got some delay between writing to the transaction log and updating their secure S with the restore. So that's how secure S and the source are very uh, tied together. So here, the transactions are the write model and the account is the read model. So let's discuss a bit more why we should be using secure S. First discussion was performance. I wanted to use Secure S because of performance, and that's the main discussion about Secure S in the past 10 years. But as of 2018, we have other reasons for creating Secure S architectures. We can use Secure S architectures for distribution, which is the main use case for uh, microservice architecture distributed systems, because we want to make the data available in other endpoints in our system, and we can't just simply rely, if I just decide that my customer information is going to be stored in this microservice. If this microservice goes down, nobody can carry the customer information, right? So first we need to make this data available across our, uh, our nodes. So we, can, we need to distribute, then we can have availability because I don't want to tolerate, uh, I need to tolerate failures here in my, in my endpoint. I also need to use CQRS for integration because if you want to distribute your data, you need to find a way to integrate how your writes and reads uh, in your, uh, all of the nodes in your system. And another thing that people are discussing this day is that whenever I have a distributed read data store and a write data store, the, the, the best approach for updating these read, these remote read data models is to create events, like low level events, for example, insert, update, delete, and this kind of, in, uh, maybe alt, uh, alter table or, or modify schema or something like that. So you generate this kind of events and you don't propagate the whole data. You just propagate the changes in your right model. So whenever you insert a record, you create an insert event, you propagate that, and the remote read data store gets this event and updates their local cache, right? So whenever you create this kind of events, you might be thinking, well, whenever I have a stream of events, I can add some analytics on top of that. That's, that's why people are using message brokers and real-time analytics systems to extract these events from these event sourcing architectures and generate some useful statistics for the business. And let's assume uh, in an enterprise information system, the most common use case is you only have one write node in your system, and I, I call that a canonical source of information. So if a customer microservice, the only endpoint in your system that is allowed to change information is the customer microservice, right? And you just replicate and distribute the data through these different read data stores. And you might be thinking, customer information, again, can be big. You only replicate on your read data store the data that you need to be processed on the remote endpoints. So you have, might have different views of your information on your read data store. It also ch uh, um, changes the way that you think about the technology that you might be using to be creating these read data stores. So here you have write data store, you generate your events and you propagate them to your read data store to create this replicated data. Some people call that replicated data, some people call that secure as read data store, just like I'm saying right now. Some people call that caches, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's the same concept, and we're going to discuss right now some of the requirements that you might have uh, for distribution and some of the technology choices that you might use for each one of these requirements, okay? Because different choices of technology, um, uh, depending on the requirements, and these requirements might be latency, size, staleness, ownership, security, and time, I, I, I put a, a question mark there because I don't know, I, I still don't have a good name for this, this kind of requirements, but maybe somebody can have an idea and, and later give it to me, right? Latency, 
the, uh, the question about latency is how long does it take to propagate the change? Or in other words, how long can you take to respond to the change? Uh, and when I say latency is this, a change happened in the canonical source of information, how long does it take for that information to be propagated to me? Uh, does it need to be near real time, like milliseconds, or can I afford 30 minutes, one hour? And some pe most people believe that I, I have a very strict latency requirement because whenever something changes there, I need immediate changes in my remote read data store. But if you think about the world that we live, it's not usually the case. Uh, whenever, for example, suppose that you, you want to generate a report. If your query takes like 15 minutes to, be, uh, to get a result, the result that you're getting when you see the report is already 15 minutes outdated. And if you think that most strategic business decisions are taking like with reports generated in the past night using a BI tool, like people are using data from yesterday to take strategic business decisions. So most of the world that we live is already a eventual consistent. And you might be thinking about different about your latency requirements because most applications can afford a reasonable amount of time between updates and getting these updates on your read data store. Okay? But it also implies different requirements of the technology. Size is another uh, discussion that we, we need to have. How big is your data set? And how big are the changes in your data set? Maybe sometimes you change your data only once a day, but when you change that, it's like one gigabyte of data that is changed every time. So, but maybe uh, you change your data like every second and you need to propagate just one kilobyte of changes into your remote read data stores. So it's another discussion that we need to have. Staleness, how often the data gets changed, which is different from latency. Latency is data has changed. How long can I afford to wait for the update? And staleness is how often the data gets changed. Okay, so updated there, I can I can stand like half an hour to get the update, or the data gets updated every five seconds. Stay, uh, stay on this. Ownership. Who owns the source endpoint of information? Is it you? Is it your team? Is it your company? Is it a different company? It also implicates different kinds of uh, uh, technologies that you need to have to implement secure as with data models. Other discussion is security. Uh, can you expose the, all of the information that you have in your right, right data model to the public? Maybe you might have a security breach. So one typical <coughs> use case for security is that, well, I need to expose the customer names in a website. Okay, it's authenticated, it's behind a firewall, everything else, but I don't want to have the liability if something breaches in. So maybe here I have like social security number information, password and something like that. So I have this in a separate environment, which is secure, and I just replicate the, the information that can be made public to another remote read data store, and I make this web server query this remote read data store. So I don't have like any uh, liability uh, concerning this kind of information. So security is another discussion. And last one, time. Do you need all of the event changes that are streamed through your bus? or do you need only the latest information? For example, if you have an IoT application that is measuring the temperature, do you need all of the temperature changes or you only need the current temperature in your sensor to, 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 to take an action? So there's another decision, but if you're, if you're using a bank system, you have transactions, debit and credit transactions, you certainly want all of the transactions if they, even if they're late. And most likely, you want them in the proper order. Or if you change it like customer, I change the name of the customer here in the right data store. I want to have this uh, information propagated and change it on the read data stores. In this case, if I'm changing the state of information which, in which the source is not event sourcing, I want to have all of the events because the order of the events matter. In transactions, the order doesn't matter that much because they are specific, they are CRDT, conflict-free replication data types, which is a specific term for distributed systems. With transactions, they are CRDT, but most of the enterprise use cases, they're not. So order matters. So you need to think about this when choosing your implementation technology. 
So now I'll discuss some different technologies that you might use for solving your distribution problems. First use case, in-memory data grids. And I'm saying in-memory data grids and not just plain key value stores because you have like different products in the market that solve this, this problem uh, in a different way. And I'm saying in-memory data grids because data grids can perform some computations on the nodes too. Uh, and in this case, they differ from plain and simple uh, read data stores. So how can in-memory data grids help you to create your CQRS read data stores on the remote nodes? First, in-memory data grids allows you to share, shard your information. So maybe you want to shard your information based on some uh, geographical uh, condition. You want the users from Romania to be stored inside Romania, so you want to shard here so the queries can be faster. And you don't want to store users from Brazil because nobody is going to query the information here, or at least not that often. Okay, so you want to shard this kind of information too. In-memory da data grids, if you really, if you really have like low latency requirements, you need the information to be updated very fast on the remote nodes. You want to use an in-memory data grid because you can have like very fast distributed transactions. You write because everything is in memory. You write here and it gets propagated almost instantly. Depends again on the latency of the network, but that's something that we can't control. So the fastest approach is in-memory data grids. You can also have some real-time analytics if you want to perform, perform again. You want to up, have updated results from analytics um, information that is updated very quickly. Maybe you want to use any memory data grid because again, it's in memory, it's very fast. And another feature of in-memory data grids that I think that is very nice is that uh, a traditional way for us to process enterprise information is that I have an application and my data is on the database. I create a query, I fetch all of the information from my database through the network, I get that in memory, I process the results, and then I write something back to my database. So I'm getting the big thing, which is the data, moving through the network, processing, and sending it back. And the more latency you have from uh, between the endpoints, the worse is your performance. So in-memory data grids, they have something called continuous queries, which allows you to, instead of indexing the data and applying the query, you do, do a different thing. You index the query, and you apply that to the data. You get the concept? You don't index the data. In the database, you create indexes, and you apply the query. With continuous queries, you do the opposite. You index the query, and you apply that to the data. Uh, how does it work? Well, maybe the initial fetch of the results from your query can be big, so you have to move that to your application. But the next results, you just index your query. Well, this query is looking for information from customer and is looking for changes in the customer name or the customer address and the customer phone number. So whenever any kind of data in your grid changes these three values, you get a notification and the data grid pushes the notification to your application. So you're only moving the data that changes. This is a typical application of in-memory data grids, okay? You have a huge data set, you have it sharded from memory, and you won't, don't want to be querying, because the traditional way for, uh, for you to know if anything changes is to be polling your database. Anybody ever created a, uh, a Chrome trigger with a, uh, a select uh, query against the database? You do that every five seconds, you get information every five seconds, and maybe nothing changes from the last query. With continuous queries, you say, I want to be informed whenever this data set changes, you get the immediate notification. So this is a very nice application if you, read, if you need very low latency updates. And another a nice thing is distributed processing. Again, traditional way is fetching the data from the database, application, processing, and getting it back. And you might be thinking that in this use case, the data is very big, but my code is very small. So maybe you're not doing the right way. Why don't we get the small part and move it to the data instead of doing the opposite? So uh, in-memory data grids, usually they have the capability of distributed processing, so you can have your data sharded across the globe. You create a, a custom code uh, in Java or other technology depending on your product or project. You just create a, this small code, which is very small, like one kilobyte, two kilobytes of, of size. You send this code to the grid, the nodes on the grid process the query and return for you just the aggregated results. 
That's another very nice application of in-memory data grids. Of course, I'm showing you here, InfiniSpan is an open source project that implements the, the in-memory data grid uh, pattern. Another way for you to create your CQRS read data store, your distributed CQRS read data stores, and you might have to forgive me a bit, data virtualization doesn't truly uh, distribute the data because you still have a, like a centralized databases and where all the information is stored. But many people uh, told me that data virtualization is especially useful when they're trying to create their very first CQRS read data stores. Why is that? If you get your monolith, your data, and you want to split that information to separate endpoints, it's very easy for you to make mistakes. And after you've done that mistake in the physical database, it's very hard for you to get everything again and be able to break uh, in the proper way. So data virtualization allows you to create virtual databases that can be uh, 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 read through the remote endpoints. And if you have like a high latency between the endpoints for your central database, most virtualization solutions already have some kind of cache, which means that you create a secure S read data store, and the virtualization solution creates their own secure S read data store. So you have like some kind of inception there. But you, if you want to solve this distribution problem, uh, virtualization solutions can add cache so you can solve it. And data is replicated, uh, availability is guaranteed, again, because you're creating a, a cache on the other side, and it allows for easy distribution. Uh, it's not usual to see people using data virtualization, but I was able to talk to three different uh, teams, uh, one here in Europe and two in the US, that were using data virtualization solutions. Two of them were using uh, TEIT, or JBoss Data Virtualization, the product one, and another team was using the Cisco solution for that, and they told me that they were, they were very happy that they use data virtualization to create this secure as with data stores. And after some months or years of using this distributed secure as with data store through data virtualization, they, they, they concluded that, well, we did it right. Now we're going to physically separate the, the data, but then it was just a matter of splitting the data and cutting the virtual database. Okay? That's why I, I usually uh, suggest people to have data virtualization. I've never seen a team installing a virtualization solution just for that, but the three teams that already had a virtualization solution were very happy that they were able to play with the database before doing any kind of physical splitting. Okay? Another technology that you'll probably use uh, when you're creating your secure S read data stores are message brokers. And again, you have, might have different kinds of message brokers. If you're using JMS, uh, you might be using ActiveMQ, or if you have, have other kinds of requirements, you're probably going to be using Kafka, which is like everybody's favorite these days. You might be seeing a lot of talks talking about Kafka, because Kafka has some very nice features. And when should you be using like a JMS topic? Uh, if your data is always stale, like for example, an IoT sensor measuring temperature, or else uh, a camera, trying uh, a, a remote process with a camera, trying to count the amount of people in this room. It's always counting and sending you the information, so you can simply discard the previous information. Or if you miss the last message, it doesn't matter for you. So a JMS top might uh, be uh, good for you. So if your data generation is high and you always receive an information, you choose a JMS topic. Another use case is stock trading information. You always get, you always get new stock price, so it doesn't matter the old value. But if for you, persistence is important, and you need order delivery, then probably you should be using Kafka. I know some, uh, one person at least complimented to me, well, Kafka is not truly ordered. Kafka has ordered guarantee, order guarantee on the same partition, right? So you have a big cluster, you might want to partition your data, like this specific queue is going to this partition, so in this partition, it's guaranteed to be ordered. And that's the use case, for example, when you have uh, customer updates, uh, insert update, delete, these kind of things. You need these events to be ordered when you process them on the remote endpoints, and Kafka is a favorite solution for using this this day, okay? It's high performance, it's distributed, it's ordered, and it's persistent, right? If you have a big enough disk, you can store your message forever, which is not typical, typical use case for enterprise, 
but you can have the disk enough for a story or a message for like one week or one month. Depends on how much time can you afford for your remote endpoint to be unavailable, right? If your remote endpoint can be one week off, then you need at least one week of persistent storage for messages. So it greatly varies depending on your use case. Another interesting technology, I didn't think about that initially, but then I visited a team in France and they told me this very nice use case that they were using a reactive platform for creating this GPS register. That's why I decided to put it here. So suppose that uh, you want to use a reactive platform like Vertex or other uh, uh, platforms. You have uh, in your, this, the current world, current world, you have like, you don't have just a single instance of your application running in your backend. Now that everything is containerized and you're probably running your application on Kubernetes or OpenShift or something like that, you have multiple instances of the same service querying some kind of information. And suppose that you hire a service from a third party and you need to pull this information through HTTP and now you have like 10 different microservices. Each one of these microservices have like five different instances running on that. So you have like 50 different instances queuing for the exactly same information to the remote endpoint. But of course, these remote endpoints, if you, you find a third, uh, third party service, they charge you <coughs> per 1,000 queries. So you used to have one remote endpoint, it was good enough for you to queue the information, but now that you have 50 and everybody's queuing for the same information, the bill is going to be very expensive. So what did this company do? And I found, of course, that's a very smart solution. They created uh, a, a reactive point, well, that's, a, that's an endpoint which mimics the remote API. They just happened to implement it, uh, to implement it ver using Vertex because you get very fast changes and it's a very lightweight solution for a, for a high throughput uh, architecture. So basically what they did, they mimicked the remote API and all of the internal endpoints, they queried this reactive gateway to get the latest information and the reactive gateway, it queries the, the, the remote endpoint. You can configure the polling interval. And what, uh, the, what they were able to do is that the reactive endpoint is, is still using polling to the remote API. So they need to configure that how, how, how often they, they, they can afford to query that or uh, how much uh, time they can afford to wait until you, they get an update. But after they, they created here a reactive endpoint, they were able to simply, well, now that everything is internal, I can have a message bus through my endpoints, and instead of having my endpoints to query the information, I can propagate the changes through the an event bus, right? Uh, in this particular case, they were using the Vertex event bus, but they could be using the writing information in a JMS topic or a Kafka bus too. It really, again, it really depends on the requirements, but I found it very interesting that they were using this just to save money on the remote API, because it might be the case for many of you, you don't want to waste your, waste your money, or maybe your boss doesn't want to waste his money, okay? And last technology that I want to discuss is change that data capture. Most developers are not aware of CDC change data capture, but it's a no time favorite of many operators and DBAs. What is change data capture? Basically, when you have an endpoint in which you don't own uh, the, the the right endpoint, suppose that you have a legacy system and you have like multiple legacy applications that are reading and writing from the same tables. So it's not easy for you to just, well, let's rewrite this part of the application and start sending events and event sourcing to my distributed bus. No, maybe it's written in COBOL and you don't want to mess with that. So you have this kind of legacy application. Uh, so in this particular case, the easiest possible way for you to start generating events to replicate the data is to plug directly on the database. So you can use a CDC solution, you plug the driver directly on the database, so you start reading directly from the database transaction log for change events. So a very nice open source solution that implements the CDC pattern is the Bizium. The Bizium, you might be thinking, uh, well, I think, I think the name is very smart because they started from DB and they wanted it to sound like a chemical element, so they are added the Ezium. So the Bizium uh, is an open source project, dbizium.io. Currently, it supports MySQL, PostgreSQL, MongoDB, 
Oracle support is about to be final, but I can't promise anything because I'm not one of the engineers. And they told, somebody might have told me that the next one on the line is SQL Server support. So you just pl plug uh, Divisium on the uh, database, you start reading from the transaction log, and it propagates the message through a Kafka bus, so your remote read endpoints can start consuming these messages and updating the read data stores. Anybody ever used Oracle Golden Gate? One, which they, some people say it's very expensive. I never had the pleasure of, of using myself. But Oracle Golden Gate does much more than that, but it also can be considered, a, part of it can be also considered a CDC solution because Golden Gate is a very uh, big solution. Okay? And this is the information that I wanted to share with you. All of this information is or will be available at the developers.redhat.com website. I would love your feedback on anything that I said or any new use case that you might have for me. And the easiest way to reach me is through my Twitter, at Yanaga. I also have my email, yanaga at redhat.com. But usually I reply faster on Twitter. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you. I forgot my Romanian, so I couldn't, yeah, sorry. <laughs>